Well, we are continuing our study in Galatians, our study of freedom and all that Christ has offered. Would you stand with me as we turn to Galatians and read the word of God together? Starting in chapter three. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Would you pray with me? Father, all of life is is grace. All the life that we live, uh, that we hope in, that would be good in us is by grace. And we're thankful for it. Lord, we we repent of, of the things that we would do that are sinful and the things that we would do rightly for wrong motives to put you in our debt or to think we could merit favor when you've already told us that you loved us when we were sinners, that you gave all your own son while we were sinners. I pray that you would Speak to us by the Holy Spirit through the message that Pastor Trent will speak today. That we might believe and know that it's by grace alone, through faith alone, through the only one, Jesus Christ alone, understood by scripture and for the glory of you, our great God alone. And may you bless Trent in the words and the boldness with he speaks to share the joy that he himself and all, many of us have experienced We pray for the transformation only accomplished by the Spirit through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So, as I told the first service today, I'm a student of preaching, and I know that um, all good sermons have an introduction. So here's mine. My name's Trent. I'm a preacher of the gospel. That's what I'm here to do today. So let's get right down to it. There it was. I hope you didn't miss it. Now, the Apostle Paul picks up here with an argument that he's been making from the beginning of the letter. And that is, it's like a parent speaking to his children who once having believed the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, they've wandered away from free grace into a performance-based Christianity where salvation comes by works of the law plus faith in Christ or faith in Christ plus anything else. And so Paul is calling them back from that kind of foolishness and saying that is not the true gospel. That's an alternative gospel. Now, he divides everybody who hears the reading of this letter into one of three categories. So we're going to be looking today at the foolish the cursed, and the blessed. And as we walk through these, there's going to be some identifiers of who each of these are because the intention is, my intention, is that you would see yourself in one of these three categories. So let's start with the first one. Who are the foolish that Paul is addressing here in this letter? We see it in verse 1. He begins by saying, 
O foolish Galatians. Now you all know that's a, that's a way to approach people when you want to win friends and influence them. You start, you, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Oh, why is he calling them foolish? He's calling them foolish for precisely the reasons I've just said. They had the gospel of grace. And they've walked into a performance-based Christianity where they're standing with God no longer is dependent on what Christ has done for them, but on what they can do in terms of obedience to the law. And so he says, that's foolish. You're foolish. In fact, he goes on to say, who has bewitched you? Meaning, an ordinary, normal thinking person would never walk away from good news this good into something like what you've walked into. So he asks, who's bewitched you? It must be that somebody has practiced some black magic on you and made you crazy and out of your minds because nobody who's normal would walk away from the gospel into this false thing that you've stumbled into. Of course, as we look at what this means, you and I might find, maybe, maybe we normal people, we can't walk away from the great news of the gospel into a gospel that is much less good news, one, that's, one that puts our standing with God somewhere on the basis of our own performance. But let's see what some of the markers are of this foolishness. And, and we can see what some of the markers are of this foolishness by the way he walks us through these next verses. And what we'll see is that those who are foolish have five distinguishing marks. At least one of these marks define them. The first one is this. Those who are foolish are those who forget Christ crucified. Those who are foolish and who wander away from the true gospel into a false gospel have forgotten Christ crucified. Look what he says in the rest of verse 1. He says, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. The Greek here is a little bit difficult to understand, but I think Calvin gets the sense of it when he says this. He says, Paul preached the gospel of Christ crucified so clearly to them that had they seen Christ hanging on the cross themselves, it couldn't have affected them more deeply than the words of his preaching. In other words, they knew Christ had to die for sin. I mean, what's the significance of Christ crucified that Paul was holding out for them? Well, if you remember from last week, Pastor Todd was was preaching on this very section. Looking back at chapter 2, verse 21, Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And then he goes on to say, you've forgotten Christ crucified, meaning... You've forgotten that you cannot be righteous. That is, you cannot be in a right standing with God on the basis of works of the law. Christ crucified means for you to be right with God, somebody had to die. That's what Christ crucified means. And, and foolish people, when we go, we start believing a false gospel, it's because we have forgotten that we can't do anything to merit favor before God or acceptance with God. Christ had to die. And when we remember that, it keeps us firmly planted in the true gospel. That's the first thing. Foolish ones are those who forget Christ crucified. There's a second marker of, of these folks, we folks who forget the true gospel, and it is this. The foolish ones are those who forget how the Spirit comes. The next verse, verse 2, he takes them back to the time when he first proclaimed the gospel to them and they received the Holy Spirit. And this is what he says, let me ask you only this, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? He says, I know you have the Holy Spirit, the, the indwelling presence of God. I know you have him. How did you get him? Was it because you were circumcised, you started keeping works of the law? Is that when God indicated his favor upon you by coming to fill your life with his Holy Spirit? No. When did God do that? Oh, he did it when you heard the gospel and believed it. That's when the Holy Spirit came into your life. That's when God declared that you were righteous and therefore a fit vessel for his very presence to take up residence in your life. Not when you did works of the law. When you believed the gospel. Those who are foolish forget that God has signified his acceptance of us 
by giving us his Holy Spirit in response to simple faith in the gospel. Number three, those who are foolish are those who forget how sanctification occurs. Theological term here, let me give you a brief definition. Sanctification speaks of the way we are increasingly cleansed of sin throughout the course of our life, where we die more and more to sin and we live more and more to righteousness. It's a work of God's grace. It takes place throughout the entirety of our lives. That's called sanctification. It's about cleansing from pollution. Now, listen to how Paul puts it in verse 5. Sorry, verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, that is, having begun the Christian life by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? You entered the Christian life By faith, you've received the Holy Spirit. God's indicated his favor and acceptance of you, putting his presence in you. And now do you think, having started that way, that you're somehow going to be sanctified, that you're going to be perfected by works of the law, by your flesh? The answer they should see is no. Of course not. Something Pastor Todd has said, and we tried to remind you through this series, is that in the Christian life, the way in is the way on. We come into the Christian life through faith in the gospel, and the way we go on and make progress in the Christian life is through continually believing the gospel and applying it to all parts of our life. Does this mean, then, that there is nothing for us to do, that if we're going to be sanctified and cleansed of sin, that that we don't exert any effort? The answer, of course, is No, but we have to understand what that effort means. Dallas Willard is a good spiritual writer. He puts it this way. He says, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. So in this process of sanctification, whereby we're putting sin to death and living more and more to righteousness, there is a level of effort we exert in this process. But we must understand that this is an effort not for grace, but an effort from grace. Having received the grace of God, we now work along with the Holy Spirit whom he's put into our lives by faith, putting sin to death and living more and more to righteousness. Christian understanding of grace is not that it is something we work for, but grace is something we work from. Those who have forgotten the gospel, those who are foolish, have forgotten that how sanctification occurs by faith, even as justification does. And then, fifthly, the foolish are those who forget, sorry, fourthly, those, the foolish are those who forget how spiritual power works. And he speaks of this in verse 5. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? I hope you're starting to see the pattern of the argument that he's making over and over and over again. You not only have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is evidently working in you and among you, even working miracles. And he says, is that happening because of keeping the law? No. No. God is showing forth this particular favor because you're believing the gospel. It's by faith that this is being unleashed in your life. And then finally, those who are foolish have forgotten how justification occurs. Another theological word, and we're using it all the time, but I want to keep defining it for you. Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein He pardons all of our sin, and he accepts us as perfectly righteous, not because of any righteousness of our own, but because of the righteousness of Christ given to us that we receive by faith alone. We're going to talk about a little bit more what that means, but I want you to know up front that's what we're talking about. Those who are foolish forget how that right standing with God occurs, but he reminds them. Back in verse 6, by pointing to Father Abraham, and he says, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. 
In other words, he's raising the point to them. You're going back and saying you're children of Abraham. The false teachers are saying they're children of Abraham, and they're children of Abraham because they trust in Christ and they do the works of the law. And he says, but how was Abraham counted righteous? And he says, Abraham was counted righteous by faith, not by circumcision, not by works of the law. He didn't do anything to earn God's favor. He simply believed God. Now, there's some of you who are coming from contexts, maybe you've been raised in theological traditions that teach that our justification, our right standing with God is based on something called infused righteousness. That when you believe the gospel, you uh, receive an infusion of righteousness, and on that basis, God declares you righteous and accepted. There are others who are coming from tradition where you understand it to mean this, that when Abraham believed God, his belief was an act of righteousness whereby God then said, that was your righteousness. Your faith was your righteousness. Those are two different ways of understanding what this text says, and neither of them actually understand what the text says. But they are easier to understand than what the real gospel actually is. At least they're easier to swallow. So what does the text actually say? This is what it says in verse 6. Abraham believed God, and his faith was his righteousness. You say, no, it doesn't say that. Okay, Abraham believed God, and he was infused with righteousness. No. What does it say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. In other words, when Abraham trusted God's provision, he was legally declared by God righteous, accepted by God. That's what we're talking about. Is he accepted? He is right with God. While Abraham was still a sinner in his heart and mind and actions, that's the scandal of the Christian gospel. That righteousness was credited to Abraham that was not his own. He was yet still a sinner, and God declared him righteous, not condemned, though he was a sinner. This, is, this throws a wrench in all religious systems. We understand religious systems. Religious systems tell us, if you're good, God blesses you. If you're not good, God curses you. This says... If you're not good and trust in Christ, you are not condemned but declared righteous. We don't have a category for that. That's another reason we know this is not man's gospel. Let me put it to you in the words of Tim Keller, who often puts these things better than I do. This is what he says. This flies in the face of all traditional religion, which tells us that either we are living righteously and are therefore pleasing and acceptable to God. We understand that, right? Or we're living unrighteously and are therefore alienated from God. We understand that. These are both works-based understandings of how we relate to God. That's the way we all naturally tend to do it. But he then goes on to say, but Paul and Abraham are showing that it is possible to be loved and accepted by God while we ourselves are sinful and imperfect. That is the Christian doctrine of justification by faith alone whereby we are simultaneously sinners and yet accepted by God, justified, not condemned. Pretty remarkable. It's pretty good news if you're a sinner. There's one or two of you out there I know at least. Listen, how does this happen? How can it be? Here's how. Through faith, we are united to Christ who is our righteousness. That's how it happens. Faith is, is the instrument by which we are joined to Jesus Christ, the righteous, and his righteousness is counted as ours. 
The theological word is his righteousness is imputed to us. It's credited to us. It's not actually ours, but it's credited to our account so that, in effect, it is. The foolish are those who've walked away from this free gospel of justification by faith alone and the righteousness of Christ given to us freely by faith and into a works-based gospel, which is no gospel at all because it depends upon your performance, your goodness, your law-keeping, and that's bad news. So, those are the foolish. Are you foolish? Uh, there's one thing worse than being foolish, and that's being cursed. So, let's talk about them. Who are the cursed? Well, the cursed we are introduced to in verse 10. He makes it very plain what it means to be cursed. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. All right. Who are the cursed? The cursed are people who are relying on their performance to be right with God. Now, if you were one of these Judaizers, you're relying on your performance in terms of keeping the law. Am I doing, am I, am I, have I been circumcised? Am I keeping track of the dietary laws? Am I, am I living up to with the standard. For many people today who aren't aware of what God's law are, they've got their own laws of morality. Am I being tolerant of everybody? Am I doing more good than I am bad? Am I not talking badly about people? I mean, what, whatever the standard is, am I, am, I, am I living up to it? And Paul says, all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Meaning, if you're hoping to be in a right relationship with God based on your performance in any way. You don't have to wonder if God accepts you or not. You can know for certain that you are cursed. That's harsh. So why does he say this? Here's why. He gives us three reasons why if you're trusting in your performance, whether it's obeying the Mosaic law or some other law you've come up with. Here's why you can know you're under a curse. The first reason he gives is that those who rely on the works of the law are cursed because they can't keep the law perfectly. You can't do it. Verse 10, the rest of it, he says, it's written. He goes back to the Old Testament. He says, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. In other words, there's no blessing for you for being 98% good on keeping the law. There's no blessing if you got it right six days out of seven in the week. If you don't abide by all things written under the law, you are under a curse. So Paul can know for certain, if you're relying on your performance and your law-keeping, you're cursed. There's no question. You can't do it. Secondly, those who rely on works of the law are cursed because justification, that right standing with God, is by faith. Verse 11. Now it's evident, he says, that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Paul says it's clear. No one, no one on the basis of their performance is in a right relationship with God because that's not how you get in a right relationship with God. How do you get in a right relationship with God? He says the righteous, those who are in a right relationship with God, they live by faith. They're not looking to their own performance. They are trusting in God's provision. That's how they're in a right relationship with God, by faith in God's provision, not their performance. Number three, how else do we know that those relying on works of law are under a curse? We know because justification by faith and works of the law are incompatible. That a justification by faith and justification by works of the law are incompatible. Paul says there are two ways you can approach God to be in a right relationship with Him. You can approach Him on the basis of your performance and your law keeping and your morality and your, your own sense of righteousness. You can approach Him that way, but if you do, you're cursed. The other way to approach Him is by faith. And this is what he says in verse 12. The law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. If you approach him on the basis of the law, 
do them. Do them. And if you do them, you'll live by them. Or approach him by faith in his provision in Christ. That's how the righteous live, by faith in God's provision. If you're trusting in yourself, you can know for certain today that you are under a curse, and when you stand before God, you will be sent away from him. What does it mean to be under a curse? It's a frightening kind of a prospect, although most of the time when we think about curses, we're thinking about sports, and Chicago Cubs fans think about the curse of the billy goat. Pretty significant curse for 108 years, right? Finally, it was broken, but the, the biblical understanding of curses is, is far more serious than not winning World Series for a long time. Biblical understanding of curses is best understood by understanding its opposite, which is God's blessing. What does it mean to be under God's blessing? To be under God's blessing is to dwell in God's place with God's presence, filled with all of the, the goodness of God, the scriptures tell us that in his presence there is fullness of joy. So, so under God's blessing, there's fullness of joy. There is plenty. There is peace. There is life because he is the source of all life. It's good. It's ultimately what we think of when we think of heaven. The opposite of that is being under God's curse. And it starts with being away from God's presence. You remember in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sin, they are put out of God's place and away from God's presence. And there they find death, they find misery, they find anxious toil instead of peace, they find strife instead of unity. It's a miserable place to be. And what the scripture says is that if we continue to be away from God's presence, not only will we die, but we will spend an eternity away from God's presence. And the Bible speaks of that as hell. Where we're away from God's presence and all of his goodness and his love and his mercy and grace and joy. And we experience only his presence in terms of his wrath and judgment. And so the Bible uses words like it's, like, it's like being eaten by a worm that never dies. It's like experiencing living in a lake of fire. It is, a, it's, it is the wrath of God for sin poured out forever upon you. That's what it means to be under the curse. In his grace, we don't experience the implications of the curse fully in this life. We experience some of it. But after the judgment, we will experience the full brunt of the curse. So that's, so that's who the cursed are. If you're, it's hard to, for us to imagine, but if you're relying on your own performance and your own works of the law in order to be in a right relationship with God, you're not in a right relationship with God. You're under his wrath and curse, and you are liable to judgment and to the pains of hell forever. That's bad news. But there's good news. There's another category of people, and that is the blessed. Who are the blessed? Is it people who give a lot of money? Is it, people, is it the good people, the ones who have the perfect kids, the perfect family? Is that who the blessed are, the ones who are always volunteering their time for? Well, some of them are. But that's not why they're blessed. Why are they blessed? The blessed are those who are redeemed from the curse. That's what it means to be blessed biblically is that you have been redeemed from the curse. Listen to what he says in verse 4, 13. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Listen carefully. You don't start life neutral, and if you do bad, you wind up cursed, and if you do good, you wind up blessed. A lot of you think that's how life goes. It's not what the Bible says about how life goes. The Bible says that because of Adam's sin and your confirmation of his choice every day, you are born by nature a child of wrath and under his curse. You start cursed. That's hard to hear, isn't it? 
But God so loved the world that he sent his only son to become a curse for us so that we who were justly and righteously cursed might by grace be blessed. Why would God do such a thing? Do you realize that's what Christ did when he died on the cross? He was, he was bearing the divine curse. The divine curse ultimately is, is divine rejection. And the Old Testament says that everyone hanged on a tree is divinely rejected. And so the scripture makes no mistake when it tells us over and over and over again that Christ was hung on a cross tree. He embodied divine rejection so that he would cry out, why have you forsaken me? He was cursed, not for his own sin, though, but for yours. Why would, why would the Son of God bear your curse in mind that we rightly deserve? I mean, we deserve the thing. Why would he bear it for us? Verse 14, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. What is the blessing of Abraham? I believe the blessing of Abraham here is speaking about his right standing with God that he received by faith. And what is the promise? Among other things, at least, it included this not just the opportunity to dwell once again in God's presence, but to send his presence to actually dwell in you by the Holy Spirit. Christ bore the curse for us. He became cursed for us so that we could stand now in a righteous position with God, blessed and filled with his presence. That's the good news of the gospel for Everyone who believes. And he says, this was being taught long before I started preaching. And he goes all the way back to Abraham. He goes all the way back to Abraham and shows how from Abraham people have been justified by faith alone. Look what he says in verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. There's two groups of people, the sons of Abraham and the not sons of Abraham. Who are the sons of Abraham? Not the people who are physically descended from Abraham, but the ones who are spiritually descended from them. How do you know if you're spiritually descended from Abraham? Because you believe the gospel like Abraham believed the gospel. That's how you know you're a child of Abraham, not because of circumcision or works of the law, but because you've exercised the same faith in God's provision that Abraham exercised. And you see, verse 8 says, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles. By the way, the word for Gentiles here is ethne. It's a word that speaks about the nations. Would justify the Gentiles by faith. Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you... Abraham, shall all the nations be blessed? How are all the nations blessed in Abraham? Verse 14, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham comes to everyone who believes. And the blessing is a right standing with God and the fullness of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. That's the good news of the gospel. So where are you? Which one are you? Are you foolish? If you're foolish, you're a person who has believed the gospel. You're, you're a Christian. You believed the gospel of justification by faith alone. You put your trust in Christ. You know that your right standing with God is not on the basis of your performance, but on the basis of Christ's performance. And yet, you've wandered away from it. And you've begun to think about your relationship with God as though it started with Christ, but now it's on me. It's foolish. 
What do you do if you find yourself, I'm one of those foolish ones who've forgotten that I received the Holy Spirit by faith, that sanctification happens by faith, that my relationship with God is based on faith in Christ. What do I do? I'm, I know I'm a fool today. What do I do? Repent and believe the gospel again. Remember what Jesus has done. Stop looking to yourself and look again to the cross and remember that he had to die for your sins, and he did. That he bore the curse you deserved, not you. It's over, it's done. Are you foolish? Let me tell you another way that we can be foolish. We change that doctrine of justification by faith alone in ever so subtle ways. Some of you believe today in the doctrine of justification by hard work alone. And every day you wake up and you go out into the world and you work really hard and you want to be productive and you want to be efficient and you want to get a lot of things done. And if at the end of the day you've worked really hard and you've been really productive, then you can feel good about yourself and you can feel like God is happy with you today because you accomplished much. I'm right with God because I work hard. But that's no gospel. That's a miserable way to live. And you know, we in ministry can do that too. Justified by my work for the kingdom alone. Or my faith in Christ plus my work for the kingdom. You know, but when we believe the doctrine of justification by faith alone, we wake up in the morning and we don't say to ourselves, if I do really well today, then at the end, God's going to feel good about me. We say, Christ is my righteousness. At the beginning of this day, before I've done anything, I'm loved and I'm accepted. And if I, if I get nothing accomplished for the kingdom of God today, he still is my righteousness. Still I am loved. Still I am accepted. Still I'm not condemned. And if I have the very best day I've ever had in my life, at the end of the day, I'm not proud because I remember that still Christ had to die for me, and he did. Now, those of you are living by the justification of not sinning alone, meaning I'm right with God so long as I don't sin. So I start the day right with God, and as soon as I sin, I'm off the rails. I'm no longer right with him. I'm condemned. Do you know about the justi doctrine of justification by not sinning alone? It's not real. <laughs> It's not true. You see, in the Christian life, when we go on in the way and, and we find ourselves sinning, we don't repent because we're condemned. We repent because of what Christ has done for us and we love him and we want nothing to disrupt the joy and the fellowship and the peace we have and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. We don't want to grieve him because we love him. We're justified by faith alone. Every time we start to look at ourselves, we say, stop. And we look to Christ and what he's accomplished. And therein we find joy in life and power over sin in our lives. You're living by the justi doctrine of justification by hard work or the just doctrine of justification by not sinning. Or, or maybe that you've got another one that I don't even know about yet. But let me encourage you to live by the true one. All right? Are you foolish? Are you blessed? Blessed are those you believe in the gospel. You're living in the joy and the life of knowing that Christ has done all. You're not looking to yourself. You're not trusting in yourself. You're not confident in your own righteousness. You're not prideful and arrogant that you're better than other people. You're not condemned because you stumble and you fall, but you are confident in the work of Christ. That's a place of life and joy and freedom. And if you're living there, keep living there. Keep looking to Christ. That's what it means to live the Christian life. Now, being blessed doesn't mean that you don't have hard things happen in life. It doesn't mean you don't encounter trials and challenges. You will. But here's what being blessed means. You know that all these things must work together for your good because you're not cursed. You might feel like it sometimes when the dog's sick and the tire goes flat and the kids are throwing up and whatever. But you know not cursed. All this must work together for my good. When you fail, you're not condemned, for you know that it was Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life. We are not condemned. All right. Are you cursed? 
Are you one of those living on the basis of your own performance? Are you hoping to be right with God because you're a good person? Because you do more bad than good? Because you haven't broken any of the major commandments, whatever those happen to be? Because you do your best? Because you're sincere? If so, then you, you fit this category. You're under a curse. Here's the good news for you today. If you're cursed, stop looking to yourself and look to Christ. Say, I know I'm condemned. I'm condemned by God's law. I'm condemned by my own conscience. I'm condemned because I can't even measure up to my own standard of righteousness, let alone God's. And I'm no longer going to look to myself. I'm going to look to God's provision. I'm going to believe the gospel that says that Christ became a curse for me so that I could experience by faith the blessing of God. And I want that. And the assurance of the gospel is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord that way will be saved. That you can also say, Christ became a curse for me so that I might become the righteousness of God so that I might be loved, accepted, forgiven. If you've believed that gospel, that good news is not to stop with you. But the blessing of Abraham that's come to us through Christ was intended from the beginning to go to the nations. And that's why we want to send out more teams in this coming year. We want to send you into your family to share that message. We want to send you to the community. We want to send you to the world to tell them about how you could be delivered from the divine curse only through faith in Jesus Christ. But if you've been delivered, then you have surely been delivered and you are freed from the curse. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord God, for giving up your only son to bear the curse of divine rejection and wrath so that we, by faith in him, can experience all of the blessings of our Savior's obedience. Forgive us where we falter and forgive us for when we go astray and we forget the good news of the gospel. Remind us of it, Lord. Call us back. Expose our foolishness and may we come back to the joy, the freedom of life in Christ. Where the law says do, the gospel reminds us only believe Christ is enough. It's in him we trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.